Welcome back to another video. I'm really glad you guys stopped by. Today we have something a little different on the channel. I want to give you my perspective on where the Canon C70 falls in the market today. As someone who owned a C70, sold a C70, decided to invest in the R5 system, got rid of the R5 right before the firmware update that essentially fixed everything, bought the R5C, have been using the R5C quite a bit, and am now considering going back to the Canon C70. I want to share that with you. Hopefully it helps you make a decision as to which type of camera might be best suited for you. So let's jump right in. So here's a little bit of backstory. I purchased the C70 as soon as it was announced. So I pre-ordered. I was one of the very first people to actually get my hands on it. I put out a lot of content, which I'll link to the playlist at the corner so you guys can check it out in case you guys missed it. But overall, I was incredibly impressed by the DGO sensor on the C70. Of course, like all things, exactly one year ago, one year ago today, as a matter of fact, which is the reason why we're doing this video, I put out a video talking about buyer's remorse, essentially giving you all reasons why I was going to move away from the C70. And of course, I was chasing the next newest best thing. And that was the R5. Fast forward to today, and I am reconsidering investing back into the C70. And I want to give you guys the reasons why. So let's move on. So let's go over the things that I really like and enjoy from the C70. Now, this is from a perspective of someone who shot with it quite a bit, sold it, and then could fully committed to the R5 and the R5C as of very recently. So here we go. That's my perspective on why I'm going to say what I'm about to say. So right off the bat, great battery life. The C70 offers what you come to expect from a professional cinema camera that Canon puts out. The battery life is incredibly efficient. It gets you through a working day without having to carry 10 or 12 or 15 or a lot more batteries or rigging it up with a V mount to be able to make it through a full production day. So for me, that is very different than what I've experienced with the R5C. As we all know, the R5C has some shortcomings when it comes to battery because it essentially just chews through batteries. There is a video, which I'll be sure to link, where you guys can kind of hack the way that it consumes power to try to help you get much more out of your battery. But of course, it's basically putting your camera on standby without rebooting. It's just putting your camera on standby. And then when you're ready to shoot, taking it out of standby, which then begins to draw the full power. But I'll link it up so you guys can check it out because I thought it was very useful and very um handy to know that that is an option if you're in a, in a situation where conserving power is necessary for you to make sure you don't miss any takes. Second point, there is no rigging required. <laughs> I know this seems kind of obvious. And of course, you can rig it. You're able to put a cage on it and you're able to use a different top handle if you want and so on and so forth if you want to. But the fact is, is that the camera by itself, as it is, doesn't require any rigging. In contrast to my R5 or my R5C, where if I want XLR audio, I then begin to need to build up the camera. Or if I want improved battery life, like the R5C, which I need to, I need to begin to rig it up. If I want to shoot at 120 frames per second in 8K RAW, I need to have an external battery source in addition to the battery that's already in the body cavity. Otherwise, the, cam the camera can't do that. And the only way to get that extra power source if you're not in the studio is by rigging it up. The C70, I can be in any situation without it rigging it up and choose how I want to shoot, where I want to shoot, without adding extra bulk to the camera. I think that's a big, big, big plus. 
Next thing, which I kind of touched on before, XLR audio. <laughs> so the camera itself, the C70, has four channels of audio, right? Two of them are mini XLRs. XLRs that also provide phantom power, which means that in a run and gun situation, I could actually rig up or attach, because the handle already has a mount for a shotgun microphone, so I could use a high quality shotgun microphone like the Sennheiser 416 or the Sheps Seamit um, 5U or any other shotgun that requires phantom power and I don't need any extra rigging. If I have more than one person who is using a lavalier system, I can get two XLRs going right into the camera. If I need four channels, so four different people, I can use something like two going into the XLR and then two going into something like the Rode Wireless Go 2 or any solution that is similar to that, allowing me to use the actual microphone input jack for two channels and the other two for XLR. If I only have one channel that's being used or two channels that are being used, I could use the next two channels as safety tracks. So the audio solutions that are built in to the C70 add to the help of not needing to rig it and give it way more flexibility straight out of the camera without any extras compared to other solutions. So let's move on to the next point, time code. At this point, time code for me has become essential. I can't shoot without time code. Time code for me in my world makes the world go around because nothing is easier than shooting multicam so you don't need to do multiple takes. You can get your wide shot, you can get your medium shot, you can get your close-up shot, all in one take, which allow you to move a lot faster. If you're only shooting with one camera, then time code today with the solution that I use, allow me to use 32-bit float audio with a body pack for the person, the talent that is actually going to be talking and time code allows me to, without any effort, synchronize and post. So having the ability to use time code on the C70 is clutch. And you might say, well, you can do the same thing with the C70, I'm sorry, the, the R5C. And the answer is, yes, you can. But the C70 uses a regular BNC connector, whereas the R5C uses a very specialized type of connector because if you use something that's too short, it will get stuck. So for me, the convenience of using a regular BNC connector with timecode on the C70 makes it that much more attractive. Moving on, DGO sensor. <laughs> There's only really one shortcoming of the DGO sensor as I see it, and that is that it's only Super 35. And granted, there are workarounds to allow you to get a full frame field of view, but the DGO sensor by far, I would say is Canon's best all time sensor. If the DGO sensor could perform in every single mode that the C70 is able to shoot, it would be unstoppable. It rivals full frame. It gives you better signal to noise ratio performance than if I was shooting on a full frame camera. The dynamic range is the best that I've seen from Canon period. So that DGO sensor really is a sweet spot for someone who shoots multimedia right, whether I could be on a commercial set or I could be on a corporate set or I could be shooting for social media, this DGO sensor makes it really, really easy for me to not need to bring as many lights or essentially save money on my lighting package. It's that good. So moving on, built-in NDs. Nothing makes me happier, honestly, than built-in NDs. Because built-in NDs, especially if I have a clear option, right? Because we can get, 
you know, Canon's variable ND, and there are other brands that make variable NDs that go behind the, the lens if you have an RF camera. But it also means you have to remove the variable ND and put in a clear if you don't need any ND. Well, when you have built-in NDs like the C70, that's already built in. It's one less thing that you forget about or leave behind in the truck. It's one less thing that you need to make sure you pack. It's one less thing that you have to make sure you don't have any dust on it or a fingerprint on it or anything like that. Built-in NDs really allow you to move much faster when you're on set as well as give you the creative flexibility to shoot at an f-stop that allows you to better tell your story in other words have fewer distractions you could shoot wide open if you want to i probably wouldn't not wide open but i love shooting at f2 and the built-in nds has you covered and that's something that i can't say about my r5c or my r5 i always have to use a variable nd and when you're out in the field especially for example i had a project where i'm out in an oil field so it's dirt on the ground it's windy you know weather is weather and if i didn't need to like it close to sunset or early morning, if I didn't need to have ND built in or engaged, right, or turned on, if I didn't need any stops of ND, I needed to go to my clear. And risking introducing dust or particles into a sensor when I'm traveling for work is a risk that is that could cost me my job, I guess, is the best way for me to say it. So built-in NDs are just a plus for me. Canon Log 2. The fact that the C70 is able to capture in Canon Log 2 natively because the codex, the sensor, is able to bring in enough information to fit into a Canon Log 2 container, right? I can monitor in Canon Log 2. It really means that I have much more latitude in post-production to make sure that what I need to be made available to tell my story, to make sure that that shot makes sense, all that information is there. I'm not saying C-Log 3 is not good. I think C-Log 3 works for a lot of different scenarios. But I've been a fan of C-Log 2 from when C-Log 2 was introduced. And that is how I'm used to shooting, that's how I'm used to monitoring, and that unfortunately is not something I can do with the R5C or the R5. So for me, that little bit of extra convenience makes the C70 a much better camera at this point. Vertical video. The fact is, is that for social media, I don't care if it's TikTok, I don't care if it's Reels, I don't care if it's YouTube Stories, vertical video is here to stay. And the vertical video game requires volume. And I'm not saying quality isn't important. Quality is important, of course it is. But volume is really what dominates. In the C70, from the get-go, was built to be able to accommodate for those types of creators in those types of environments. And the fact is, is that the majority of us running our own production um, businesses, at this point, not only are we shooting stills, not only are we doing video, but we're also making sure that we capture and get content for those vertical video platforms. And I think that the C70 makes it super easy without rigging to allow us to get vertical video. So. For me, that's an extra, and it's a good plus. I wasn't always a vertical video believer, but the fact is, is that if I want to stay in business, I need to accept it and add it to my arsenal, which we have, but not having to rig it 
makes it much, much more convenient. Also, if I show up with a C70 that is ready for vertical video production, my client is not going to try to compete with their cell phone and say, I can do it with my cell phone. So then there's that. 10 bit codecs. So the fact that I have all that color information and flexibility to where if I didn't absolutely nail my white focus, I can correct it in post production is a major, major plus for me with the C70. Of course, we have all those codec options on the R5C2. So it's kind of a wash there, but it is a strength of the C70 because those um, codec options, as well as the DGL sensor combination, are really, really powerful. Raw video when I want it. So people asked for it, Canon gave it to us. We now have raw video on the C70. I'm not sure if I would shoot raw video on the C70 because I, from when I had it and what I shot with it, I can trust that the DGL sensor with those long up um, or all eye codecs is able to give me the, the image quality that I need and the quick turnaround that I need to be able to deliver volume that is also high quality. 120 frames per second when I need it. I don't know what it is about the way that 120 frames per second looks on the C70, but to me, it looks very, very organic and cinematic. You guys have heard me on the channel mention things like Komodo has natural depth to it in the, the way that it captures images. Well, the C70, to me, has that very similar natural depth when I'm shooting at 120 frames per second. It looks very organic, it looks very filmic, and it does not look digital like I see out of my R5 or the R5C. And by the way, I sold my R5, as I mentioned earlier, so I now only have the R5C. So I really like that as an option. I can get full frame field of view on the C70 with the focal reducer that Canon makes. So it's Canon glass, which means it's going to be high quality. And my depth of field is going to mimic full frame depth of field. My only problem that I had, you know, back when that initially happened, and I'm running through like a madman trying to wrap my head around all of what this camera is able to do, I didn't really appreciate that on Canon CNE lenses, the actual witness marks, right, that tell you exactly where your focus plane is. So if the camera sensor is, say, one meter away, and I dialed it into my witness mark as one meter, when using the focal reducer, it wasn't quite in focus. So I didn't like that that changed, and I thought it was a problem with the way that the focal reducer worked with the C70, when in reality, it must just be a witness mark change of the way that it works that caused those measurements to be thrown off. Now that I understand the problem, I don't have an issue with it because there are plenty of ways to make sure that my image is in focus and I'll just pay attention to that. So now let's go over what I don't like because I think that that's also important to bring you know, balance to the conversation, particularly since I owned it and now I'm considering buying it once again. So let's go through this. Mini XLR inputs. They're not my favorite. And the main reason why they're not my favorite is because I am used to using the Sennheiser AVX and the receiver, the one that plugs into the XLR, it's made to go straight into an XLR and it's full size. Which really means that on the C70, I need to use a cable adapter, full size to mini, so that I can make that work. Having the extra cables 
coming from someone who was shooting on red DSMC2 for a few years where I had zero cables really drove me nuts. And where I'm at now, here I am a year after I sold the C70, I now understand that that's not a big deal. <laughs> it's just not a big deal. Because every other camera on the market, including the R5C, including my Komodos, it doesn't really matter which camera. I have to sort out how to get XLR into the camera unless it's something like a C500, a C300, a C200, right? C100 even. Every other camera, I now need either an extra top handle with the XLR adapters if it's a Sony camera. If it's going straight into the body, only Canon cameras actually are doing that right now. Or I need some sort of way to adapt it. So the C70 having mini XLRs, while it was a big problem for me, in, in, mainly in my head, right? I now don't care. I still don't like the fact that they're mini, but I'm glad they're there. And that's just the truth. Another thing that drove me nuts back then was the fact that the handle is fixed. You can't articulate it, right? So Canon gave us a couple cameras, you know, before the C70, where they were still small. They were 4K only. You could shoot RAW if you wanted to. They shot on CFast cards. I think it was the XC10 and XC15. But the handle, you could always articulate it. And coming from the C300 world, C300 Mark II and the C500 Mark II, those handles could be articulated. You could even remove them and have an extension. So I was always accustomed to those things. And when I started shooting with the C70, that very quickly became something noticeable because based on, depending on, on how I was shooting, there were times where my wrist would fatigue and I needed a different solution. The different solution really is use the top handle that is included. I didn't do that. And that's one of the reasons why that became a challenge for me. I, to this day, and guaranteed that if I buy it today, it arrives today, as much as I'm going to love it, I'm always going to hate the fact that as soon as I put a lens on it, just like my 1DX, it's going to tip forward. That's just the fact of the way that the body is built. But fortunately... Again, experience, right? And after shooting with other systems and learning workarounds, I know that I can buy a base plate that is long enough and wide enough to sustain the camera upright, let it sit upright, even when I have a lens on it. So unless I put a very heavy lens on the camera, my camera will not tip forward. And the person or the company that makes that base plate also happens to make the quick release plates that we use on every other tripod, dolly, jib. The only thing we don't use those on are gimbals in this company. And that's Kessler Crane. So that will be my solution for this thing that irritates me of the camera tipping forward when I have a lens on it. The weight is not balanced on the top handle. So if you attach the top handle to the camera and you put your finger on it and you have a lens on the camera, it is not going to be balanced because you can't adjust it forward or backwards. It's in one spot and that's where it is. That's a little annoying, but if that really does get under my skin, I don't think it will, but if it does at some point, I can simply use a cage, and then get a top handle that I can, in fact, adjust forward or backwards to create that balance that is not achievable, not, achie not easily achievable anyway, with the included top handle for the C70. 
the rear screen is kind of small. And that's true. At my age, I am really comfortable with a seven inch screen. That is not a seven inch screen. So it is a little small. It does allow you to set up your composition. You are able to make sure that you're exposed properly. So that's really not a problem. But if somebody left, say, a bottle of water in the shot, it might be difficult to tell. And that's the reason why that's a little bit of a, a bus kill for me. But if I know that I'm going to be in that, that type of environment or scenario, then I know I probably should attach a larger monitor, which is what I do with all of my other cameras. Red, Canon, I did that when I owned Sony. So attaching a monitor is just part of production, part of the way that I now work, the way that my team now works. So it is what it is, and I can live with that. The fact that it's not full frame without the focal reducer really means that the price of the camera plus the focal reducer is really the package or my spend, what it is that I'm looking to spend. The good news is, is that I own two focal reducers because I use the focal reducers already on my Komodo because my Komodo, my Komodos have more than one, are also not full frame. The real advantage to a Super 35 camera that can mimic full frame field of view is the fact that it allows you to shoot in what RED calls multi-format, or Canon is beginning to do the same thing with their full frame cameras, where you could window in on the sensor and get a Super 35 or smaller even. On the R5C, I think we could even go I'm sure we can all go down to Super 16 if we want to in 2K. And that is actually a huge advantage. Of course, when we do that on the R5, we're going from 8K to 6K Super 35 and then 2K Super 16. On the C70, we're going 4K and staying at 4K with that wider field of view. Is it a trade-off? Yes. Is it something that is a deal breaker? The answer is no. Because the fact is, is that for me, with anything having to do with products, right? Anytime I have to shoot products, especially if it's if they're delicate products, like I have clients in the jewelry industry where diamonds are a part, a big part of product photography and product videos that we produce for them. Super 35 is the right format, the much better format when compared to full frame for those types of shots. So the C70 would actually come in handy in those scenarios because if I'm using the R5C, I will be switching to Super 35 mode. And that's kind of where I'm at. Do I like the fact that I have to bolt in the focal reducer to make sure that it's super rock hard steady? No. Can I live with it? Yes. It doesn't have a locking RF mount. Neither does the R5 and neither does the R5C or the Canon EOS R or none of the Canon cameras that have the RF mount. But the Red Raptor absolutely has a locking RF mount. And I wish that Canon would take a look at that and then sort out how they can begin to implement that into their next generation cameras. So is it a deal breaker? The answer is no. Is it, would it, it be a nice to have thing? And the answer is absolutely. And of course, the C70 is only 4K. I believe that at this day where 4K deliverables are normal, the sweet spot for production is 6K. 8K is even better because resolution does in fact help you. It does matter. It helps you deal with things like noise. For example, if you capture in 8K and you deliver in 4K, you don't need to denoise. There's no need. It looks very organic 
and it doesn't look like, like digital noise or fixed pattern noise. On the C70, you don't have noise issues because you have a DGL sensor for starters, right? But you're also capturing in 4K and then delivering in 4K, which really means get your framing right because you're going to have very, you're going to have limited flexibility in post production. So, would I like to see the C70B a five or six K camera? Absolutely. Is it a deal breaker? No, because what did I say in the previous slide? The social media game is about volume, and when we can deliver volume plus quality, the C70 delivers that in spades. This one was something that caught me by surprise and actually one of the things that triggered that whole buyer's remorse video. The DGL sensor doesn't work in every single format. If I go to slow, um, if I try to shoot in slow motion or off speed, right, and I'm also shooting in log, the DGL sensor is gonna basically say, yep, you're down to the normal version of the sensor, not the, the one that captures both exposure levels and then composites that image for you. That was a bummer. I wish there was a way to fix it. I wish that somehow Canon could sort out if they could do a firmware update and make that work if there's enough processing power in the camera. Is it a deal breaker? No, because the fact is, is that any shortcoming from any camera, whether it be a Canon, a Sony, I was gonna say Nikon, but the fact is that's kind of funny because I would never use Nikon for video. Any shortcoming from any camera, RED, Sony, Canon. If you understand it, then you can work around it. And working around it is really what allow us to then be successful. And now that I understand it, I'm okay working around it. This one is, um, I don't know why aesthetics matter to me, but they do. And when you use that larger battery, right, the one that gives you twice as much than what's included with the camera, it sticks out quite a bit. So it looks like the camera's got some junk in the trunk when it's got that extra battery. And because it creates a little bit of a shelf, it then also, it just aesthetically doesn't look super pleasing. Is it a deal breaker? And the answer is the trade-off, much more battery life. Honestly, I can live with it. Would I like it to all be flushed like it is on every other camera? Sure, every other Canon camera, I should say. And the answer is sure. But then that would also mean that the form factor would go from being chunky to being blocky, which is what we already have with the C300 and the C500 Mark II. So I think that I'm going to live with this. So what's next? Where do we go from here? And I think that after thinking through all of the ups and upsides, the downsides, the things I had problems with before, I'm going to end up eating crow and buying a C70 and bringing it in and having it be our content camera, the camera that is dedicated and allows any single person in, on staff or on the crew to go out, get high quality content for our social media clients. I think that that's where it's going to start. I have a feeling that once we are all enjoying that workflow again, it may turn into two or three Canon C70s instead of what we're using right now for those types of projects. It's just kind of interesting to see this roller coaster that I've put my crews through by making some changes based on personal biases and chasing after that new piece of gear. I don't regret the road that I took, you know, choosing the R5, choosing the R5C. What I do regret is the opposite of what I said in my buyer's remorse video. I regret not giving the C70 the full chance that it deserved because clearly it has a place in my production, in my workflow, and in this company's success. So 
we will be picking one up. And I'll let you guys know how that journey goes. If you guys enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed and you like this type of content, this type of podcasty content, be sure to subscribe because we're now moving back in, creating the content that we want to create, and we're done with those dedicated product sponsored videos. I'm really happy about that. It's something that has made a huge difference in my life. And I want to go back to just having this friendship that we all started with on this channel. Until next time, I'm Carlos, and I will catch up with you guys in the next video. Take care.